begin then. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. <clears throat> o God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful, grant us by the same Holy Spirit to be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> okay, it's Tuesday, March 16, 2021. The gospel comes from St. John chapter 5, verses 1 to 16. Okay. This is a very interesting gospel, and we would attempt to answer plenty of the uh, questions related to um, matters about illnesses, sickness, okay, and sin. Basically, perhaps uh, we could answer the question, is there a connection between illness infirmity uh oh <laughs> and sin okay uh oh somebody just woke up <laughs> and wants to be with papa hello say hi say good morning huh say good morning she just practically woke up walked out of bed and now here okay we're going to read part of the gospel ava okay yeah can you read with me okay we're not going to read the whole gospel, but parts of it in order to help us understand some meaning. There was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, at the Sheep Gate, a pool called in Hebrew Bethesda, with five porticos. In these lay a large number of ill, blind, lame, and crippled. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. <clears throat> when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been ill for a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be well? The sick man answered him, Sir, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe irritated with Jesus. <laughs> Why do you ask me that question? Don't you? What do you think am I doing here? If I didn't want to get well, I'm not going to sit by the pool here hoping that when the angel comes to steer this pool, uh, I can be the first one there to so I could get healed, right? Because that was the, the custom, that was their belief that once in a while, an angel would come down and steer the waters and whoever gets there first gets healed, right? So this man perhaps was maybe a little irritated with the question of Jesus but he was patient enough. He's been waiting there for 38 years. So he answers Jesus in a patient way. And he asks, says, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. Because I'm crippled and, you know, I can't really get in there. So, yes, I want to get healed, but I have no one to put me to the water when it gets stirred. So, when the water is stirred up, while I am on my way... Someone else gets down there before me. So someone beats me right, to, the, to the water. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your mat and walk. Immediately the man became well, took up his mat and walked. Let's stop there for a moment and consider this. I mean, Jesus knew that the man wanted to get well, right? Why does he ask him? Why does he even ask him if he wanted to get well? Hmm? Anybody? Oh, you want to get down, honey? Oh. What? Why does Jesus even ask? Isn't it obvious? Who wants to be sick, right? And he was already there, precisely, uh, waiting for an opportunity to be healed. But... Why does Jesus have to ask him, do you want to be well? Okay, you know, sometimes Jesus wants our cooperation. Jesus wants to confirm 
our intention that we really, really want it. Okay? That we have the humility to admit that we want to be cured, we want to be healed, we want to be uh, um, comforted, that we want to be relieved of our miseries. Sometimes Jesus has to prompt us to test our resolve. Okay? So, we have to show a little bit more of humility. Like, do we really want to get out of our of the trap of sinfulness or the cycle of sinning that we sometimes get get entrapped in do we really want to get out of there sometimes not only sometimes it will always require our affirming that desire before Jesus and telling him I really want to get out of this trap. I really want to get healed of my sinfulness. I really want to get out of this cycle of always sinning. Please help me. I have no one to put me into the pool. Or I have no one to get me out of this rut where I have been stuck for 38 years. In, you know, like this man. Maybe in our case, it's not 38 years. Maybe it's two months, one month, one week, three years. That we have been in that cycle, in that rut, in that trap of being sinful in that way. That there's no one who can take us out of there. So Jesus, please help me. Right? I couldn't seem to get help from anywhere. Please give me the grace of healing. Give me the grace of forgiveness. Have mercy on my soul and heal me. Just like the blind man Bartimaeus when Jesus was walking the streets and Bartimaeus was hearing the commotion, say, what's going on here? So, oh, Jesus of Nazareth eh, was passing by. They say, hey, son of David, son of David. He was yelling out to Jesus because he was the only one who could perhaps heal him. And when Jesus turns to him, he asks him also, what do you want me to do for you? <laughs> it's similar to the question that he asked this crippled man. Right? Do you want to get healed? Jesus asks Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And what does Bartimaeus say? Domine ut videam. Lord, that I might see. Can't you see? I'm blind. That's what I want to, I want to reverse this blindness. And I want to see. And Jesus goes ahead to do the miracle. Many times, many times our Lord wants to hear it from us. Many times our Lord wants our humility, wants to hear our humble pleas in prayer that we get healed from our sinfulness and the trap we have embroiled ourselves in because of our own sins. Right? Now, of course, the man got up, was so happy, okay? He was now uh, able to walk and he started to go about the temple and people recognize him say hey, weren't you the guy sitting in that pool because you were crippled who cured you he didn't even know who and one day jesus who was still around there in the temple oh they cross paths again and what does jesus say jesus found him right jesus found him after jesus found him in the temple area and said to him look you are well now, right? You are well. What does Jesus tell him? What does Jesus tell him? Pay attention. You are well. Do not sin anymore. So nothing worse may happen to you. Do not sin anymore. So nothing worse may happen to you. Sometimes... People look at that particular sentence in the gospel and try to try to connect it and say, is there a connection between getting sick and sinning? Is sickness, is ailment a punishment for sin? Eh? It's a question. It's it's a it's a theological question that people um, struggle with to understand. 
So let's try, let's try to explain it a little bit. Okay? There are different ways of looking at these things, different ways of looking at, at illness, sickness, or infirmity of any kind, or even, or even just bad situations that happen to us. Okay? We have to be able to look at these things in perspective all the time. And, and how do I propose we look at this? We start from the first fact. And what is that fact? That God is all good. God is good. That God cannot be the author of evil. Bad things do not come from God. God does not will that we suffer evil things. God does not, does not take pleasure in us suffering. God does not send us bad situations because He wants to give us a hard time. Okay? That's not what God does with His children. Because no father wants that for his children. God okay. chastises those whom He loves. What does that mean? It means that, very briefly, God wants to also share with us share with good people especially good people share with them the opportunity to bear the cross of christ remember what remember no master no no disciple is above his master right if they persecuted me they'll persecute you what is our lord saying here and he says in many other parts of the gospel take up your cross daily and follow me right so he's sharing the cross to good people to people who he knows who he knows he can trust to be able to bear the cross and participate in the salvific mission that he has carried out 2,000 years ago because salvation keeps unfolding in our present day. And we, who are disciples of Jesus Christ, can all be part of this salvific mission if we learn to take up our cross. And that cross can take the form of many things like inconveniences, small inconveniences, big trials, big sicknesses that sometimes we are made to bear, right? And sometimes good people are made to bear because that way our Lord is sharing the cross with us. And we can think of many good people who have suffered illnesses particularly, right? They're good people. Why do bad things happen to good people? Right? This is the answer. Because it is a sign of God's love, ironically. It is a sign of our Lord sharing the cross with these good people. Because they being good, they will understand that they are bearing the cross of Christ and participating in the whole salvific mission of Jesus Christ. Right? And you can think of your own grandparents, your own grandpa Oscar, your own grandpa Jacob, Grandma Aleli, all good people, very, I dare say, holy people. They love God. They do everything uh, uh, according to the will of God. Why did they suffer the sicknesses that they went through? Is that because God is punishing them? Is that because God didn't love them? I believe the contrary, okay? That God is actually sharing the cross with them. And you can look, look at many other saints. There are many other saints who suffered actual physical injuries and, and illnesses. And they're saints. St. Saint Teresa. Okay? Uh, uh, St. Padre Pio, who had the stigmata for decades. Right? Uh, many other saints. They suffered illnesses. Because that was their way of purifying their souls to begin with. It's a form of purification. And at the same time, it's a form of participating in the cross of Jesus Christ. So that was all good. And that is not definitely a punishment right, for their sins. It was rather for them a participation in the salvific mission of Jesus Christ. But on the other hand, yeah, there are some bad things that happen to other people. Not because God is allowing them to participate in his salvific mission, but because most of the time, it's the fault of these people that bad things happen to them. 
Okay, but what's the relationship of that to sin? Can sin be the cause of why bad things happen to some people? Well, if we take what our Lord says here, the answer is yes, right? When he said, so look, you are well now. Sin, do not sin anymore so that nothing worse may happen to you. Well, our Lord himself suggests here that yes, bad things can happen to some people because of their sins. But those bad things happen to them not because God is trying to punish them. Rather, those bad things that are happening to those kinds of people are happening to them because of their sin. Why? What's the connection? What does sin do to us? What does sin do to us? One of the effects of sin, especially mortal sins and repeated venial sins, what do they do to us? They do two things. They cloud our intellect. They muddle up truth in our heads. They cloud our intellect. Number two, they weaken our will. They weaken our resolve to fight against sin and our resolve to become saints. They make our will lazy, complacent, slothful. These are the effects of sin. They cloud the intellect. We cannot anymore see what is right and wrong. It's so difficult for us to understand why something is supposed to be right and why something is supposed to be bad. See? And that's why we end up questioning things. We entertain all of these crazy questions in our minds. Why? Because our minds are clouded, murky. We cannot see through the truth. Hey? Because that's the effect of sin. And that's why you ever wonder why some people don't change. It's because they cannot see it. They cannot see what's wrong with them. <laughs> it's always other people at fault, not them. Because they cannot see it. Their minds are clouded because of all the, <laughs> all the sins that have, been, that have been compounding in their soul. They have been blinding this person not to see through the truth about himself okay, and about his own sinfulness. And then second, it weakens the will. Just makes the will so tired to even fight, to even put up a fight against temptations. That's the effect of sin. That is why it's so easy to tell whether somebody is saintly or sinful. It's so easy. <laughs> you don't need, of course, maybe it's easy for people who understand it. Okay? It's so funny how, you know, some psychologists nowadays or this whole brouhaha about psychologists, psychiatrists, you know, trying to diagnose problems with people and why people don't change, why people do things and that they're not supposed to do. Well, because their minds are clouded by sin <laughs> and their, their wills are weakened by sin. That's the effect of sin. That is why people who don't understand the Catholic faith and don't understand the whole nature of sin and human nature. They don't understand people. They don't understand what they're doing. Okay? That's why our Catholic faith is very rich in the understanding of human nature. Okay? We have an explanation for these things. Okay, so, okay, what happens when your mind is clouded and your will is weak? What do you do? What happens to you? What's, what happens to that person? What happens to that person is he makes bad decisions. See? He makes bad decisions. Why will he make bad decisions? Because he cannot see the truth. He cannot see the truth. He doesn't have a strong will 
to be able to get to the truth, find out what's true about things. Okay? And therefore, they, they will never be able to tell what is good and what's bad. So therefore, they fall into misjudgments. They fall into making wrong decisions, bad decisions that they think is good for them. And you can, you, can, you can really apply this to anything, the most human, the most mundane things. For example, I mean, okay, we have to qualify this, okay? I don't mean to say all people who are obese are obese because of sin. Some have genuine physical defects and their, some of their organs are not functioning properly. That is why they become obese. But a lot of people who are obese, have become obese because they have been gluttonous. They don't know how to control themselves when eating. They eat, eat, and binge, and binge, and binge on sweets, and everything like that. And, you know, the more, the more gluttonous they become, the bigger they become, and the more clouded their mind becomes because they cannot think. They don't know what's right and wrong anymore about how they eat. Right? So, they end up having bad physical conditions. They end up getting sick. So that sickness from obesity to diabetes to many other things that are related to physical illness could have perhaps been avoided if only they didn't fall into the sin of gluttony. Okay? But the sin of gluttony has ushered in all of their bad eating behaviors that led to all their physical uh, illnesses. I mean, that's just one, <laughs> one example. You can cite many, many, many other examples that are related to sin. Think of pride. Think of pride. You know, well, so many bad decisions emanate from pride that can cause plenty of destructive consequences. People get fired from their work because of pride. People get in trouble with their neighbors because of pride. People uh, commit all sorts of crimes because of pride. Sin. The sin of pride can cause many problems. Anyway, it, the sin, okay, our sinfulness clouds our intellect, weakens our will, and that leads to making bad decisions that cause us to be in trouble. Okay? In many kinds of trouble, including physical illnesses. Okay? So let us not be surprised. Now, question is, how do we overcome all of this now? How do we overcome the tendency to make bad decisions? How do we overcome the tendency to sin? Okay? One of the things that we do not often hear anymore nowadays, especially in, 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 in the pulpit or in catechism classes or anybody else teaching this many this very basic point i'm about to tell you is something that has been lost in many a, a an effort to catechize the faithful what is this thing i'm talking about it is the avoidance of the occasions of sin the avoidance of the occasions of sin we, we often talk about sin and that we should avoid sin. But we don't, we, we don't talk about how do you avoid falling into sin in the first place? Well, there's such a thing as not putting yourselves in an occasion of sin. Okay? In an occasion of sin. So you want to avoid making bad decisions. You want to avoid putting yourselves in a bad situation or in a bad predicament. Well, avoid sinning that may relate to that, that may lead to those bad situations. How do you avoid sinning? Well, avoid the occasion that may lead to those sins. So avoid the occasion for sin. And by the way, let me just put it very clearly to you before I forget this. Avoiding occasions of sin is our very first obligation to do if we don't want to fall into the trap of sin and the cycle of sin. We have to avoid the occasions that lead us to sin. And if we don't, 
if we don't avoid and run away from those occasions of sin, we are already committing a sin. The sin of putting ourselves in the occasion of sin. And if we do that habitually, that can be a mortal sin in itself. Just putting yourself in that occasion of sin. Okay? So the antidote to avoiding bad situations that can lead us that can lead to bad consequences for us is to avoid sin because avoiding sin means we don't cloud our minds and we don't weaken our will but how do you avoid sinning well avoid the occasions that lead you to sin and what are occasions of sin they can be circumstances they can be places they can even be people and they can even be activities they can come in any form, in any form where the devil can tempt us into committing a sin. So putting yourself in an occasion of sin means putting yourself in a situation, situating yourself, right? In a place, in a time, in an activity, or in a relationship where... The devil can precisely tempt you into committing a sin or sins. Okay? Let's give you some examples. Let's give some examples. These things, you don't hear it, this thing anymore very often. And actually, I haven't been hearing these kinds of prescriptions in a very, very long time. But you hear it here at home. And, I, okay? and I'm going to, let's see if you can guess. Okay? Some of the rules that we have at home are because of this, because I want to keep you away from occasions of sin that you can be committing. Okay, one rule that we have in the house is something that relates to the bedroom. Let's see if you can tell me what rule that is. Oh, God bless you, Ava. What rule do we have when it comes to the bedroom? What's that, Shavi? Huh? What is that, Eva? What's that, Joseph? Don't stay in the bedroom. Don't stay in the bedroom. Especially don't stay in the bedroom, locking the door, okay? And just staying there and having alone time. That's an occasion of sin right there. What sins? Many sins. Sin of laziness to begin with. Sin of idleness. Sins of impurity. Okay? Many things, many sins can happen when you are in your bedroom with a locked door alone. Remember that an idle mind is the devil's workshop. Okay? The bedroom is a place for sleeping. The bedroom is a place for changing your clothes. The bedroom is not the place to just laze around and do nothing. The bedroom is not the place to be secluded alone with your thoughts unless you're praying. <laughs> Maybe I would, con I would concede that unless you're praying. Okay? But to be in, a be in the bedroom to sulk okay, and do those things, that's an occasion of sin right there. And that is why we have that rule at home. Never. Stay in the bedroom with a locked door unless you're changing your clothes or unless you're sleeping. Never, because that's an occasion of sin. Okay? Another room where we have a rule in the house not to stay in for longer than necessary. What is that room? What is that, Chevelle? Shout it out. I don't hear you. Bathroom. Okay? The bathroom, Ava. Right? The bathroom is an occasion of sin. <laughs> How many people are even think about The bathroom is an occasion of sin. Right? There's so many things that can happen in a locked bathroom. Okay? From sins of impurity, again, sins of idleness and sins of other <laughs> unmentionable things that can happen inside a bathroom. That is why, what have we always said? 
You don't stay in the bathroom longer than is necessary to brush your teeth, to take a shower or whatever it is. Not a minute longer. Because every minute you spend there that is already outside of the necessary chore of why you are there is already an occasion of sin. And speaking of bathrooms... Another occasion of sin is staying in front of a mirror longer than is necessary to groom yourself. <laughs> okay? So stop counting how many pimples just cropped up your faces. <laughs> You're going to have these pimples for a few more years. There's no point counting them. There's no point trying to, to, to see what, which of them have healed or which of them are cropping up again. You know, eruptions happening on your faces or noses. Vanity is a very, very terrible sin. And something that seems so innocent as a mirror is in itself an occasion of sin for many. Okay? And vanity leads to many other things. Vanity leads to many other sins. Okay? So, what else? Computers, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> okay, computers, why do we use computers? We use it for work, we use it for uh, 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 studying, right? Once in a while we use it for entertainment, but that's precisely what can be dangerous with it. When we tend to use it beyond what we are supposed to use it for. And that goes same with television. Okay? I mean, the computer screen is just another form of media. The media outlets themselves can be an occasion of sin. When we are alone with that computer and we think we're the only ones there, and we think that we are not being watched, or even if we are, it doesn't matter. The fact that we're using that computer to entertain ourselves in many illegitimate ways. Okay? or to derive some kind of pleasure from doing things we're not supposed to do and access on that computer. Those are occasions of sin. Pornography happens a lot on the computer. Okay? Speaking of pornography, magazines can be an occasion of sin. You can see plenty of them in grocery stores. That is why when you're in grocery stores, you avoid looking at the magazine racks because they are a magnet of temptation right there. Right? Billboards while passing through freeways and, and streets. You see plenty of billboards that, that are magnets for, for, for sin, occasions of sin that could be used to entice your senses. These are occasions of sin, which you need to avoid. What else? Um, what is that, Ava? Oop, you got a rock. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, what else? Uh, uh, riding in vehicles, riding in cars, alone with somebody of the opposite sex. Some people don't make any anything out of it. Maybe once or twice. It's okay. But once that becomes a habit with the same people involved, that can be problematic. And you may at first not think anything of it, but the more frequently that happens, it breeds something else. And it can be an occasion of sin. Okay? A lot of people don't realize these things. A lot of people don't think of these things. But I'm warning you that these things are and can be occasions of sin. Maybe on the surface they are indifferent, right? On the surface they are in different situations. Maybe you would say, what's so wrong about looking at the mirror? What's so wrong about this and that? What's so wrong? Yeah, on the surface they may seem indifferent. But let me tell you, the devil can use anything, anything, even what is supposed to be good. He can turn it into an occasion 
for sin. And we already know what are the more common situations the devil's favorite uh, <laughs> temptation grounds are. So the more we can avoid these common areas, these common things, the better for us. The better for us not to put ourselves in these occasions of sin. Okay? So, you want to avoid bad situations in life? Avoid sin. Because sin clouds the intellect, weakens the will, and leads to bad decisions that later on become bad situations in life. You want to avoid clouding your mind, weakening your, inter your, your will. Because of sin, avoid the occasions of sin that can lead you to commit those sins. That's the pattern. That's the program. And that is what our Lord says here when he admonishes this now cured former crippled man. Look, you are well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse may happen to you. Of course, ultimately, also, what is the worst consequence of sin? In the ultimate analysis, what is the ultimate bad consequence of sin? Huh? What is that, Jacob? Death. Well, yeah, of course, everybody dies, but even good people die. But ultimately, the people who sin, who live a life of sin, what is the worst consequence that they will merit? Huh? I cannot hear you, Chevelle. Huh? Hell, of course. Hell. Okay, very good. Very good, Mia and Chevelle. Hell. That is the worst consequence of sinning. So sin no more so you avoid worse things that can happen to you. Not only bad situations or illnesses, but ultimately hell. Nobody wants to go to hell. So let's avoid the occasions of sin that would lead us to hell. Okay? Okay. That is it for us today. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye, ah, Ava. You want to say bye-bye here or no? You're busy playing. Okay, she's busy playing. Okay, have a good day, everybody. We'll see you again tomorrow, hopefully. Bye-bye.